some of the best advice I was given, and I still give this to the girls I work with and the testimonials have been amazing from this piece of advice. But my coach, when I was a teenager said, when I was going into ODP tryouts, he saw that I was really focused on myself and my performance. And that was really like riling me up a lot and making me really nervous that it was almost crippling. It's good to have some nerves, but if it's crippling, then that's where it it gets a little dangerous. But he said, Erica, don't focus on self, focus on supporting your teammates and making the girls you play with at trouts look amazing. (laughs) And I was like, wait a minute, like, don't focus on self. Like, don't I want to do well? Don't I want to be the best at tryouts? But then I was like, you know, I'll just try his advice. And what happened at tryouts was I was communicating the most. I was motivating my teammates the most. I was making the most runs off the ball because I was trying to make them look good so that their pass to me looked great. And everything just clicked because I was focusing on making everyone else around me better. And that's just been so nice. And just, it it relieves a lot of pressure from girls when, when they show up and they focus on being a good teammate. And if you're trying out with girls that you likely don't know, uh, they're from other clubs, um, they're just complete strangers. the, The best thing you can do is make friends with them right when you get there and introduce yourself, introduce yourself to the coaches, just come back to the basics and, and be a good person. And that's going to make you feel more comfortable in a situation that, seems foreign. Now, as far as what, what Shay said with, you know, maybe worst case scenario happens because it can, you know, that's an absolute possibility and that's okay. It doesn't need to define you to, to Shay's point. And you can take that worst case scenario and always ask yourself, okay, if I don't make this team, will I be okay in the end? And usually the answer is yes, you'll be okay. And you can find some sort of meaning in that moment when you don't make the team. So maybe you didn't make the the top team you wanted to make. And maybe you use that time to change what you're doing with training or to stay on a lower level team and gain, gain a little bit more confidence. Or maybe you had great friends on that lower level team. There's, there's always some sort of meaning to find in that situation when, when you do fail and you're going to fail in life. I mean, there's been times I haven't gotten job opportunities. I'm sure you guys can say the same, or I didn't, you know, get writing gigs or sell as many books as I want. It happens every single week, you know, <laughs> and we have to learn to find meaning in those situations and, and be prepared for them to, to pivot when needed. That is huge. Um, it, you know, I just took my kid to uh, Spain for a week where he was invited to, to, to train with them there for a month, for a week and the way that he was accepted right away was so shocking and yet inspiring because it's so not the way he's here you know all the kids there didn't see him as oh my god here's another kid that comes in and he's going to take my spot he's going to steal my place he's going to whatever They were like, no, he's just another kid who's going to play with us. Mm -hmm. And when I see here tryouts, it's like this, oh, but are we going to make the parents start to freak out? But that is, (laughs) you know, like this panic. And I think that the more panic we put in as parents, the more panic the kids feel and the worse it gets. Yeah. So can I just say something to that? So... Yes. I'm so glad you said that because every tryout season, the parents are freaking out more than the kid, yeah, right? Totally. They're, they're the ones who are, are bringing the, the drama and the worry. And then the kid's just like, whoa, like this is, this is too much. And I've seen situations where parents will email the coach when the kid doesn't make the team. And they're like, my kid deserved to be on this team. Here's why. And it's like a whole dissertation. And this happens with so many parents. First of all, that's going to turn the coach off. (laughs) If you do that, that you're definitely not going to make the team at that point. Second of all, when your kid later in life doesn't get a job or they didn't get, they don't get accepted into that school. Are you going to stand up for them when they're an adult? Are you going to be holding their hand through their 20s and their 30s? 
So it's, it's like, what's, what, what are we trying to exemplify to our kids? Like, what are we trying to teach them when, when we act up like that and do things? Mm -hmm. So that's just what I've noticed that there's just more like anxiety coming from the parents end and trying to control the situation. And oftentimes they're just trying to make up for their kids lack of talent. They're just not good enough to make the team or they're trying to make up for their kids laziness. They didn't work hard enough to make the team and they're compensating for these two things. Their kids just not talented or they're lazy and parents aren't willing to accept that. Yeah. Sorry. Can I add, can I add to this? Yeah. So Erica, I love how you said like, if they don't get a job or if they don't get accepted into college, you're going to email the Dean or you're going to email like, the thing is, is, is parents right now, and I'm not a parent, so, you know, I'm not judging, but like, it's, it's like this snow plow. Like anytime you have an obstacle, I'm going to get that obstacle out of your way. I'm going to remove any obstacles so that you don't have to deal with any obstacle. And then they don't know how to deal with failure and mistakes and all these kind of things. So it's, that's completely detrimental. But then also, yeah, with tryouts, like sometimes the kids will be like, yeah, I got to try out. And then the parents will be like, you got to try out. You got to, you got to start working. You got to come on. You're going to get behind. You got to start doing your, your touches on the ball. You got to get faster. You got to get stronger. And then the kid is like, oh crap, this is a big deal. I better, oh shoot. I'm nervous. I, I, I got to go. I got to go. Right. And so I think, yeah, it's like the parents energy, the kids are going to feed off of that. And so it's like, if the parent is just more chill about and like, yeah, go have fun, like do your best, like you are prepared, you just have to trust in your preparedness, then the kid is going to go out and do the same thing. So it, it starts with the parents. So I'm so glad that you brought that up, Joel. Well, because that it was, it was a culture shock for me to be in Spain, because first of all, the parents are not there. Mm. The parents drop off the kids and leave. Yeah. Now, granted, the most times in America you finish work around five or six I mean I'm talking about most jobs not you know the regular nine to five or finish around five or six they take the and then they take the kids to work right uh there when practice is at five six seven most people are still working because the day doesn't end until like mm -hmm. seven or eight depending on country right but it was amazing to see just and kids don't care about their parents there were literally, even at the younger ages, there were so few parents present. I mean, I was there, but I was, I was trying to stay away. I, I mean, I never say anything anyway, but it was just fun to see that there's nobody. The comments are at a minimum. Nobody's yelling from the sidelines. You cannot even talk to a coach. Like, it's not allowed. Like, I didn't even know where my kids' practice was supposed to be. And I had to ask a coach because I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't know where I'm supposed to go. And they were looking at me like, who are you? <laughs> you know, like, why are you talking to me? <laughs> but, and of course, they were very nice. They understood and they helped me. But, it, I mean, because it's a different situation. But it was like, you are a parent? What, what are you doing? Mm. And here is the exact opposite. And it just, it was like, like I said, it was a culture shock for me. And I have to say, my kid loved it. He was like, oh my God, this is fantastic. Um, but the way they treat the kids is with so much more respect. Like at the end of the week, when they gave him feedback, he was by himself. They went through a PowerPoint presentation. I mean, it wasn't just like you sucked or you need to do this. No, they went through a power, seven page PowerPoint presentation. I was like, oh my God. And I wasn't allowed in, which I was very happy. I mean, I wasn't asking for it. But I love that moment. That, and he was like, ooh. Because it, all of a the sudden, they're getting very, very specific. In, you know, hey, you need to do better at this. You need to be better at that. This, you did fantastic. This, you were, keep working on this. You're doing great. Just keep going. You know, stuff like that. It was so specific that he wasn't even upset to be hearing feedback. He was like, oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. I get it. I have to do this I have, because I think that helps you. If somebody tells you, hey, you need to work better on opening up your hips if you're playing soccer or passing the ball or whatever it is, that you can work. You can wrap your head around, right? Mm -hmm. Mentally, you can wrap it around your head. You can say, okay, I can do that versus someone saying you need to shoot better. What the hell does that mean? Right? I mean, there is a goalie on the other side too that is supposed to stop me. So, I mean, what does that mean, you know? There's a defender too that he's supposed to stop me. I mean, I'm not going to be able to get by them every single time. 
But is that what we're doing to kids though? Are we so here in the US more, we're not focusing on how to help the kids. Um, and we're only focusing on kind of taking kids that are already quote unquote good, whatever that means. Uh, or they're strong enough, again, whatever that means, because I mean, that's just a pointless word, really, by itself. Um, or should we be more, again, focusing on specifics? You know, because I, wouldn't it be, if you're more specific, doesn't that help the mental aspect of a kid? The mental perception of a kid, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think so. Because like a lot of times kids will, will come to me and they'll be like, I got, I got pulled out, I got benched, and the coach didn't say anything to me, or they just gave me really vague feedback and it didn't help me. So I think a lot of times coaches maybe sometimes are scared of like giving feedback because they don't want to hurt their feelings perhaps, but the more specific feedback you can give to a player, I think the more they're like, oh, okay, like I see what I need to do and now I can actually go do it instead of me wondering what I can do. And then that's where all the overthinking starts like, oh, did they think that I didn't do this well enough or do I need to do that? And so just give them the feedback like straight up and then they can handle it and they can actually run with it instead of letting them just like go kind of down this rabbit hole of like overthinking. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it seems like there's just way too much vague feedback happening here. And it seems like out there in, in Europe, they're really focused on player development and specific me measurables. And like Shay said, a, a lot of girls are just confused all the time or um, you know their coach is being unpredictable with the playing time and there's no answer as to why it's just something like oh well you need to work on your first step and it's like well has anyone measured the time 10 yard or a time 20 yard and tracked it over a year no none of these coaches have and I get these player evaluation forms every single time and it's like you need to work on acceleration speed strength and this and it's like has anyone measured with a timing system has it, does anyone have objective data because the kid has no clue what to do but once you have that that data and you show hey you have not improved here but here's where we need to go and the action steps we need to take to get to this next step or to trim a few milliseconds off this time so that you're faster in the game and no one's doing that um coaches don't don't have time for it and unfortunately um like from the performance perspective there's no performance staff at a lot of these clubs or the lower level teams the rec teams are the last to get a performance coach ecnl always goes first they get one but everyone else, it's just like figure it out on your own or just remain in confusion on how to do any of this stuff and how to truly develop uh, physically, tactically, technically, and mentally. And I've seen that this happens, especially with girls. Um, because I remember last season when I was subbing someone, one of my best players, and I subbed her because I had to tell her something. And so I subbed her, she was, she's one of my best players, and I took her out and I said, hey, Get some water come back after tell you something and then go back in and she looked at me like i was some unicorn it's like you're actually telling me why you took me out and like what you wanted yeah. and it's like well yeah. well i do that with boys too but i noticed the mo the monumental difference when coaching girls how few girls are told what is happening and girls love the feedback. They, they really do. Like they'll, they'll take it, they'll be receptive and they'll take action, but no one's really giving them that specific feedback. And I don't get it. Uh, it I really don't. It, it's one of those things that make no sense to me because I always find, I mean, like I said, it works. It's the same with boys too. When you tell them something, they look at you like, oh, okay, now I understand what you're talking about or why you did something or you said something or whatever it was. But especially girls, like you said, they love it. They crave it. It's like they want to do something. They want to make you happy as a coach. But if you don't talk to them or you just yell at them, then what's the point? You're destroying them. Yeah, I mean, and naturally girls are more people pleasers. So they, that's why I think why they crave that feedback because they're like, tell me what I can do to make you happy, basically, right? And girls are really, really receptive um, but yeah, I don't really know, like, like why aren't girls getting as good of feedback as boys? Like, I, I don't know the answer to that. I find, I mean, in my, 
just coaching high school and especially in the neighborhood that I'm coaching the high school, it has to be cultural. Because so yeah. many, um, and I've noticed that making the movie that we're making, it, a lot is cultural. And I know sometimes it's taboo to talk about that, but it's almost, it, it takes over everything on how we treat girls and boys but especially girls like I had moms telling me um, I mean I had kids sorry telling me that they couldn't come to practice because they had to go home and cook mm -hmm. 14 year old girls mm -hmm. why is a 14 year old girl supposed to make dinner for the whole family um, why can't a 14 year old girl take an hour or two to practice while a 14 year old boy can't mm -hmm. You know, what are we telling these girls? So to me, it's like, which again, mentally, then we are putting them at a disadvantage and we're putting all this added pressure the night they don't go home and make dinner, they feel like they failed. On yeah. top of being, a, you know, well, now coach is mad at me because I wasn't a practice. Right. The, like, I have to do it all kind of thing in order to be worthy. I have to please my parents, my coaches, my teammates. I have to do everything. And, and that's, that uh, happens with moms too. Like you have to be everything to everyone. So I think it is just the, just, yeah, the culture of, of women, what's expected of women to just figure it out and, and be there for everybody else kind of thing. And to add to that really quickly, how do we work with self-identity? Because athletes in general struggle with that. You know, if you're, if you're not a soccer player, who am I? If you're not a baseball player, who am I? You know, if you get hurt or you miss out or something happens and you can't play anymore. It happens to the adults. I mean, how many professional athletes, right, freak out once they stop playing whatever the sport? But if you, on top of it, the women and girls, it's even worse. Yeah, you see that a lot. You see a lot of girls and I, I'd say male athletes as well, uh, placing their identity within their sport and their, their value. And I know Shay's been there before. I've, I've definitely been there, but it is important to encourage them to do other activities, to find other hobbies and to just use different parts of their brain because they're, they're going to need that for academics, college, their, their career. But, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, you mentioned the professional athletes and, and there are some kids that that's their goal. So their focus from high school on is that that single sport, which is fine. That's probably, you know, why they're making it to that level. Maybe they dabbled before high school and other activities, but once they hit high school, they're like, that's my thing. I want to go pro. And they're like laser focused <laughs> on that. And maybe that's why they have success and go pro. But like you said, a lot of professional athletes will finish their career. And then they look around and they're like, oh, now what? I spent the past 10 to 15 years just focused on this thing. Now I don't know what to do with my life. And I'm 40 years old, may maybe even younger for some sports. And they just don't have these other skills that they built over the years to maybe start a business when they're done or do a nonprofit or maybe start their own podcast or whatever. And they are kind of like picking up the pieces and, and figuring it out when they're in their thirties or forties. So, um, you know, it's, it's just interesting to see that, that professional level, that's like the top that's glamorous. That's what some people want, but then when the pros leave, they, some lose their minds and they have no clue what what's going on. And there's extreme examples like alcohol use, drug use, and all these crazy things that you hear about in the MLB NFL and all these other sports organizations. And it's like, well, did you guys have anything else going on in your life? Did you have your relationships? Did you have your other hobbies or your purpose or faith or anything else going on besides this thing? So it's, those are things that we need to talk about with young athletes. Just that holistic picture of, of sport and not putting their worth in just one basket. Yeah. I mean, I'll kind of echo everything you said, Erica, but it's really like letting kids know and everybody really that you are not what you do. I actually, my sister shared with me 
I guess she does like a, a, an affirmation, like prayer thing with her two little girls who are three and five every morning. And it starts with, I am not what I do. I am not what other people say I am. And it was like, it kept going on, but I'm like, how powerful would it be if, if kids knew when they were little, that they're not what they do, that they're not what they have, that they're not what other people say they are. And so having that belief and just knowing that as you go through your thing that you're passionate about, yeah, go through it, like be dedicated to it, but just know that you are not that thing. And then like Erica, you, you brought up something really good where it's like, you have to kind of find a purpose outside of the sport, something that really like drives you as a human being, because your sport, it's great, but like, it's just a sport. Like it's not the end all be all. So I think it's really important for people in whatever way they find that in, in faith and nature and whatever it is to like find that really deeper purpose that really shows you who you are. Cause you're not what you do. You're not your job. You're not your kids. You're not like any of that stuff that people say we are. That's so important. Um, and that I, I find it to be one of the big issues sometimes when we do talk about mental health is that we kind of get caught in cliches, but we don't talk about it. We don't, we kind of hide behind words, but we don't explain. We don't let the kids feel whatever it is that they're feeling in that moment, validating. And I mean, I've made that mistake too, because sometimes we are caught in our own things and you want to make them feel better so you say something and then you realize later ah crap you know i should not have said that uh, because probably the kid then feels like you're not listening you're dismissive you know things like that so how can we as parents and coaches learn to listen better but also as kids well, well not just kids i mean even high school and even adults really how do we um, learn to speak speak up? I, I want to say first that mental health is more than just mental. It's, uh, it's emotional. It's mm -hmm. your physical health manifests in your mental health, um, social, so your community and people you can trust and who have your back. It's also spiritual, so that's where purpose comes in again and, and purpose of serving others and helping others. But it's, it's like all these things. And it's so hard for me to just come up with even just a couple recommendations for people because the decline in mental health could be for so many reasons, you know, and, and we've seen in the past few years, a lot of really tragic events happen. And there could be many reasons why these, these things happened. Um, Katie Myers suicide, and it, it could have been something just, just built up for years. Um, who knows, you know, what she was dealing with when she was a child, um, who knows who she was surrounding herself with, or, you know, just the environment, um, or maybe coaches not listening along the way or not having role models. We, we never know, or any other kid who, who suffered from men mental health issues, maybe they're not eating the right foods that boost their serotonin and really nourish the chemicals in their brain. So it, it it's so many things, but um, just with this, just really coming back to the basics and Joel, you said it, like, it's really important for everyone to have a community so they can't hold in their emotions. It's the worst thing you can do is to hold things in because eventually it's going to explode into something more dangerous or some sort of breakdown. So it, it's important for young athletes to have good adult figures who, who listen and who can guide them. And then also friends who just inspire them to, to be healthy uh, mentally, physically, spiritually, and just be surrounded by a good community of people. Because with the mental health, a lot of people try and do it on their own and they repress and they isolate. And that's the worst thing uh, you, can, you can do for yourself. Yeah. I mean, we really have to start normalizing as adults. We have to start normalizing, uh, feeling our feelings, feeling our emotions and not pushing them down, not being embarrassed about them or putting shame on them or judging them because that's that's I think why a lot of people struggle um, with their mental and emotional health health is because they they just suppress and they distract and they and they like Erica said, if you suppress for long enough, 
it's going to come up in one way or another, right? So I think it's so important that as parents, we learn how to actually feel our own emotions and show our kids, hey, it's okay. I'm having a hard day. It's okay. I'm depressed. It's okay. Like I'm allowed to feel all these feelings and letting the kids know, like one of the most powerful, like statements you can say to your kids is you are allowed to not be okay. You are allowed to feel sad. You're allowed to be anxious. You're allowed to be depressed. Because for me, like going, having anxiety for a majority of my life, I felt like I was broken. I felt like there was something wrong with me. I felt like it was a something that I wasn't supposed, that I wasn't allowed to feel. Right. And so just being allowed to feel those things, like life is meant to be felt the good, the bad, all in between. So if we can just feel those emotions, they will eventually go away. But as the more we suppress them, the more they really have a grip over us. And so the other part with like, you know, community and, and having friends and people, for me, it was like my whole childhood, I was completely alone in what I struggled with. I thought I was the only one. I literally was like, I'm the only one on this planet that like feels the way I feel, that's seeing the world the way I'm seeing it. And I didn't know how to talk about it because I thought that it was something to be ashamed of. And so now I'm so big on like finding people to talk to about it and, and letting you know, your kids know that they're, they're not alone. Like you're going through it too. We're all going through it. Nobody's perfect. Nobody has, feels good all the time, right? Like our goal shouldn't be to, to feel good all the time. Our goal should be to feel everything, no matter what it is. And so I think just normalizing that is one of the most powerful things we can do for our mental and emotional health. That's beautifully said. Um, I noticed that the more we empower kids to speak, the better and the more specific they get. Because I've noticed that if, I mean, I've had conversations with parents where I told them, they were, sorry, they were telling me, oh, Bobby or Jimmy or Stacy or whoever was, you know, is acting up and they don't want to come or whatever it is. And I said, well, have you thought that they were tired? Right. You know, something as simple as that, you know, nothing crazy, but you know, you had a lot of games this week. You have school until three, four in the afternoon, whatever it is. No, that's impossible. Kids don't get tired. You know, the usual comment that you get. And I just almost chuckled because it, it, it and cried at the same time because it's like, you get tired, right? And he's like, yes, so do they. <laughs> it's, not like, it's not like you get tired only once you're past 18 years old. You know, under 18 years old, you never get tired. Over 18 years old, okay, now you can be tired. Um, you know what I mean? But that something as simple as that, like one day say, you know what, let's go to a movie instead. Oh, yeah, Joel, I want like I want to add something to this, um, and it's really important to like like let their kids know, let, let let your kids know that their feelings and their emotions are valid. That it's not like something like oh no, you don't feel that way. Like no, like that's one of the only actual truthful things in this life is our feelings and our our emotions. Like that's just real. That's fact. The thoughts we have around those are not fact. The beliefs we have around those are not fact but the emotions are. And our kids are way more in touch with their emotions than adults because they haven't been programmed their whole life to bring on society's expectations of them. So like really like let your kids follow their feelings. Let them really like learn from their emotions because your emotions are so powerful. They're, they have so much to teach you. They have so much wisdom. So the more you can let your kids really like feel into them and follow them and speak about them and share them, the, the more they'll be able to like stay in touch with them as they get old and get more programmed. <laughs> that I think like the, the adults play a huge role, like, like Shay said, and just the way adults talk to kids or let or not let their kids experience emotions, but also even just simple things like body language during games some adults body language, even I'm not just talking parents, I'm talking the head coach and me as the performance coach as well. Like we need to be really aware of the body language because if a adult, maybe it's the kid's dad is pacing up and down the sideline or just kind of like rolling his eyes or like huffing and puffing it, when the kid makes a mistake every time on the field, then yeah, the kid's going to be anxious 
every time they step on the field because they're expecting that reaction and they're so afraid to make that mistake again. So adults really need to pay attention to the body language. And even at the start of a session for, for coaches, are you animated? Are you like welcoming your girls? Are you getting them excited and getting them excited about having a competitive practice where they, where they get better, not a practice where, where you yell or berate them. I really think you can teach athletes criticism without ever yelling. I don't think I've ever yelled in my 10 year career and coaches need to just create that environment where it is competitive, but it's also joyful and girls, girls aren't anxious. They're, they're excited to compete. And they're like, you know what? I might lose this race, but I'm going to give it my best. And they show up and, and they try. So I think it's really important how adults have body language and how they, they structure the, the training environment for these athletes. Oh, come on. Yelling is a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get your energy out sometimes. <laughs> No, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but yeah, no, actually, it is a little bit of fun sometimes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I no, meant, right. yeah, I meant like in a in a derogatory way, or you <laughs> no, know, I, know, I, I know, still I know. see coaches <laughs> cursing at players, and I, you know, for me, that's just a big no no, and that's not how I roll. Um, so yeah, just total like berating is just it doesn't. No, no, that's ever. no, of course not. But uh, you know, I did that once, and I think I told you that before. Uh, one of my biggest mistakes as coach, and I always like, it still haunts me, even though it happened two years ago or three years ago. Uh, it's like, you know, I was coaching this younger girl's team and one girl is taking off. She's on a one-on-one -on -one, and there's a teammate of hers next to her, but she's outside by 14 miles. And so I started screaming at the girl, don't pass the ball. Thinking in my head, she would understand girl outside don't give her the ball because the whole thing is gonna go bye-bye but then I realized what did I just do because at the end of the day all that girl understood was I'm not supposed to pass the ball to my teammate right <laughs> but I'm thinking just outside and then I realized oh no what did I do so half time comes I tell the girl I am so sorry and I explain to them what I what I actually meant and they were like, oh, because she didn't, I mean, they were younger, of course, so they didn't really know outside and all of that. But that taught me is like, sometimes you're saying something, thinking in the most positive way, you're thinking the game, you're thinking, you know, let's not, you know, but then it actually comes off wrong. Mm -hmm. And how many of us don't self, are not self-aware enough to realize oops, you know, and I didn't learn that until I remember that I was talking to Reed Malfi, who told me one day, film yourself coach. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And when I saw myself, it wasn't like anything horrible, but I saw a lot of the things that I was doing that, you know, they're ticks or things that you don't even know you're doing. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was, I was like, oh my Lord, what am I doing? Like, I was always like this, I was always like this, and I was like, and you don't even know you're doing it, right? Like you said earlier, your body language gives out, you know, it comes, you don't even realize it. Yeah. But then when I saw myself, and I wanted to kill him for making me look at that, but at the same time, I was like, thank God I did, because I, it's now every time I go like this, I go, no, no, I can you know, it's like, you know, don't, now I'm realizing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah I, I think coaches should but also parents because I know too many parents who yell and scream from the sidelines and they think the kids don't know it you know when I interviewed those four kids at my house a couple months ago they all of them told me they know exactly what their parents are doing yeah they always know what their parents are doing even if they can't quite hear them even if they can't quite see them, they know where they are and they are always looking. Mm. Yeah. And we can, we have to not do that. We have to stop that in some ways because what was fascinating too, when I asked them, why do you play? All four of them without even skipping a beat 
for fun. Yep. We didn't even get to, I mean, some of them, you know, one of them said, you know, I also want to have a good team. I want to win some games and get better. You know, of course, all of those things came out after. But it was like four or five things down the list. It wasn't number two or number three. It was like seven or eight. Mm -hmm. I, I recently talked to Dr. Amanda Stanick. She came on my podcast and she's been in the long-term athletic development, physical literacy, literacy space for so many years now. And she was saying the, the number one reason kids stay in sport is because it's joyful. But then the number one reason they quit is because it's no longer joyful. So her, her mission is all about protecting that joy and again, like cultivating that environment where yes, they are getting better as players, but they're also enjoying the practices. They're looking forward to them. They're leaving with a huge smile on their face. And I, I have a huge rule for myself with sessions. It's like, I want the kid to like get in the car on the way home and like rave about how fun that session was, or it'd be like, I can't wait to go back to training with coach Erica the next day. Like that's, that's the standard. And I, I think more coaches need to reflect and just look at their sessions, their team culture, the environment and ask, is what I'm planning protecting this joy or am I driving these kids to hate this sport more? And that's the worst thing to get to as a coach is to have kids quit. And, and most girls quit by age 13, age 14, because it is no longer fun or they're burned out or they've had overuse injuries. And it's, it's just really important because the, the numbers are so alarming and we really need to look at them and then reflect and change what we're doing. Erica, that question of how can I protect their joy? Like that's magic. Cause like uh, for me, and you can probably say the same too, Erica, like the best practices, the ones where you, like when you were a player, when you felt like you got the most out of it, were the most competitive for me, it's when we just like let loose and have fun where we like the coaches weren't talking that much, but we were just like going out there and competing, maybe a little trash talking, but just like going out there and competing and like thinking about those practices. I'm like, oh my gosh, like I want to go back and play, but like most of the practice we're not that way. So I think a lot of times coaches think, well, why am I going to protect their joy? I need them to like get better and we need to focus and we need to, uh, you, can right? do like, you can do them both at the same time. <laughs> you can <Yeah>. do both <laughs> and they're going to get way more out of it. If they're having fun, like you're not ever going to have a, a really productive practice as if everybody is depressed and everybody's like, oh, I don't want to be here. Like the way that they're going to get the most out of it, work the hardest, develop the most is if they want to be there. And if they're having fun, period. I had a coach tell me that I was running a session and the kids were laughing and having a ball and it was intense. Like we barely stopped. And the kid and the coach came in and said, I have to stop you. This session is ridiculous. I can't believe you're so lucky. You, you're not taking it seriously. And I was like, uh-huh. And then the energy, as soon as he took over, went, and, and I'm not saying that, oh, I'm a genius coach, but it's just like, how can you, like in your job, I tell this to parents all the time. When you are in your job and you're miserable, are you productive? Mm -hmm. And they tell me that's not the same thing. Like it's the exact same thing. <laughs> it's yeah. exactly, if you're miserable, you're not productive. If you hate it, you're not productive. In whatever it is, you could be making an egg. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. In whatever it is, you're not going to be productive. You're going to crack the egg. You're going to you know, burn it. You get something is just not going to come out right because you're not, your heart is not eating. You're not, you know, paying attention. You don't care. I, right? You know, I just thought of something really funny. So for, for parents who, who work a job, um, it would be way more miserable if their kid came into their office <laughs> and criticized, you know, them in their meetings or writing a report or emailing their boss. Like, imagine if your kid just, paste in your office like you do on the sidelines that would be miserable but not a lot of adults put themselves in in that shoes so it's I just thought of that <laughs> I love that that's hilarious yeah I always wanted to do that I always wanted to do that 
because that would be a good so like true. live stream or something like kids sit in on adults work and criticize them. we should start a new national day bring your kids to work day and we just tell the kids just get on them about every little yeah. thing <laughs> And then slam so your miserable. hand, <laughs> slam your hand on the table too, just for kids. Yeah. Make it even more dramatic. <laughs> Throw something, you know. Do <laughs> like make it really dramatic, or oh, but, that's isn't it? but that's what we're kind of doing to these kids, right? We're kind of shutting them, teaching them to shut down. Yeah. That of being open, and then you do hear about these horrible, horrible things that are happening with, unfortunately, so many kids dying. Mm -hmm. uh, they shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. And I know there's more to it, of course. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into play. It's not a one size fits all solution. I mean, I, I mean, I wouldn't even begin to. I'm not a doctor. I don't even want to go there. But mm -hmm. I think that if we were providing a healthier environment for our kids to begin with, yeah. hopefully those numbers would be lower at the end of it. Yeah, I think That's so. Coming back to the joy too. Yeah. And that, that starts as young as, you know, when they start playing their sport, whether it's like age four or five or six, like that joy and the coaches at that level need to make it so fun. But even when they get to the higher level in high school and college, yes, it's, it's more competitive. There's higher stakes, but there are ways to make that culture fun. And I remember at Johns Hopkins, like that was what the program was known for was the really fun culture. So I think you're right, Joel, like that environment and setting that up in the first place so that all these years we're, we're taking care of these kids. That's, that's way better than like, you know, waiting to react and then something bad happens and we're like picking up the pieces, you know, we got to be more proactive and, and front end things a little bit more. And I think it's about changing our priorities from uh, being on the best team. Like fun should be the top priority. Like life, life in general is meant to be enjoyed as, as we need to have more fun in general. Like it's, it's a game. Like games are supposed to be fun. Like as we're talking about it, I'm like laughing in my head like, wait, what have we done to the, what, have, what are we doing? Like, this is supposed to be fun. So I think just like changing our priorities, like ECNL, whatever the freak those numbers, they don't mean anything. Like, just go have fun. Like we need to allow our kids more space to just play and have fun and be a kid and mess up and get dirty and do all those things. Yeah, you know, I just had a, one of my high school girls blew her ACL a couple months ago and her dad refused to let her take get surgery for a month because she she had to go back and play because she was going to miss out on being the starter of her whatever it's not ECNL but MLS next I don't know one of those whatever uh, <laughs> one of one of them not important get your yeah. surgery <laughs> and I was and this poor girl and she was like coach I'm sorry you know she was all depressed and she still is uh, and I told her say look you're still one of my players. But she was like, well, coach, how can I be your player if I can't play? I said, well, first of all, that's like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But you can help me set up practice. You can, we can watch film together. We can talk about it. We can do all of these other things. And yesterday she messaged me saying, hey, coach, I can't be there today, tomorrow, today, but I can be there Thursday to help you with practice. Is that okay? So we can, I can help you with the tryout. Yeah. And that to me is like where we should be with kids. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't matter if they're actually physically on the field or the court or the, whatever the sport, but we got to meet them where they are and help them any way we can to make them realize that they're more than just the game. They can do so many more things because who knows, maybe she ends up being a coach, right? One day, I don't know. I mean, obviously now she has had surgery and she's, you know, for a while she didn't even have physical therapy, which is, oh my goodness gracious. I don't even want to go there. We don't have time. But I'm like, what? Well, yeah, what kind of parent? I can't even imagine that. But that's anyway, like I said, but just to really help our kids, not just the ones we coach, but our own too, once, you know, you have them. It's like, we got to do more than just, one thing because like I said you can start as a player but who, I mean what's wrong with becoming a great coach who knows maybe she's going to become a hall of fame coach or maybe she's going to be a general manager or maybe she's going to be who the hell knows what she's going to be mm -hmm. but why are we limiting someone for what we think they should be doing 
Yeah. We, we tend to put people in boxes and put ourselves in boxes. And the reality is, is that we can't, we can't be contained, especially like kids. Like as soon as you put labels on them and put them in a box, they feel like they're stuck in that and they can only be that thing. Um, so yeah, that just along that line, Joel, is just really be aware of the labels that you also put on kids because that can really stick onto them. Well, thank you both so much. Um, before we wrap up, um, can you please tell everybody where they can, where you can be reached uh, and how you can be reached? Yeah, I guess I'll go first. Um, so my podcast is Alpha Real Confidence. Um, and then you can find me on my website at alpharealconfidence.com and then Instagram and Twitter is at Shay Haddo. I'm just on Instagram and Twitter, just trying to keep it simple. <laughs> and my, my handle is fit soccer queen. So feel free to DM me if you have any questions. Well, thank you again, ladies. Uh, I know you're super busy, so I really appreciate you taking a few minutes to talk to me and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Joel. Thank you.